Just go to get to him there, you know, lead them to thy open side, the sheep for whom thou shalt have died. It's like brings it, it's like what is life for? What is this life that we have? We were touching on that um, this morning. If you have a Bible, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 25. <coughs> Matthew 25. And starting at verse 14, we call this uh, the parable of the talents. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man travelling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. When he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received the one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. <coughs> his Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the, thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury, usury is his interest. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's some of these parables are quite short, aren't they? We're just kind of, you know, a, a thought, an idea. This is quite a long parable, but again, it's actually quite simple. Um, and, and it's one that I've heard other people preach on, and I don't think they've quite got it right. Um, so I, I want to, I don't want to label the point, but I want to make it clear really this morning to get you thinking in the way in which the Bible is using these words. So it's called the parable of the talents. And a lot of time people sort of think talents, okay. So they think in terms of like, you know, talent shows, like, oh, yeah, you know, Paul's really talented at playing the spoons or something like that. No, that's not what it's saying. It doesn't mean that kind of talent. Uh, the word talent, as it's used there in the New Testament, uh, means a balance or a weight. So in, in those days, you know, you would have silver or gold, a certain weight of it. Uh, and, and then with that, that weight of gold, you'd be able to buy things. So it was like a, like a, a, a resource that you could then use. And so that's what it means when it says the parable of the talents it's talking about something you have that is of value uh, that you can then use. And the picture was, wasn't it, that uh, uh, the Lord 
wanted his servants to use that talent, use uh, what they have that's of value for him, and to gain him interest, right? To, so that when he returned, uh, they would have interest. So the, the the last servant, of course, is is uh, he's rebuked for not having used what his lord had given him to gain interest. So let's look a little bit closer. So we've got three servants. One has five talents. Uh, one has one has two talents, uh, and the other has one talent. And when the Lord returns, we find that um, the first servant has gained five more, making ten talents. Uh, the second has gained two more, making four. And the one with the one talent has not gained anything, and he just sort of says. Here you are. Yeah, it's like, like, I'm not going to church. Paul just does maths in the morning. So it's like, here you are. Here's, here's the talent that you gave me. I'm giving it back to you, Lord. And in the one side, it sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds like, well, look, here I kept it. Nobody's touched it. Nobody's done anything with it. But and I was, I'm just going to give you back what you gave me. Are you pleased? Are you pleased? It's clear from the passage, isn't it? It's not pleased. Far from it. The exact opposite. So. What do these things represent? What, what, what are all the different uh, things that we have? And, and where do they come from? You know, how do we, how do we interpret this uh, as Christians? Well, I think the talents that it's talking about are all the, all the resources you know, that we possess. So just to uh, 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 give you a rough idea. So it might be your intellect. We sang that in that wonderful hymn, didn't we? Uh, you know, take take my life, take my moments, my days, take my hands, take my voice, uh, uh, take my intellect and use. That's why I chose that hymn. You know, it could be your intellect, it could be your time. Maybe you have a lot of time on your hands. Well, you can use that for God's kingdom to glorify God. It could be your communication skills. Some people are really, really good at communicating, other people are not so good. Uh, it could be it could be your your tenacity, your your, you know, your determination to see a thing through. Uh, it could be the opportunities that you have. It could be your wealth. You could employ all these things, could be for the kingdom of God. It could be the time that you live in. Sound a bit odd, but, but think about it. You know, uh, if you go back hundreds and hundreds of years, Christians then, if you wanted to share the gospel with somebody, you'd have to go up to them, uh, talk to them face to face, and tell them all about Jesus. Now, you don't even need to leave your own home, do you? You could send an email to somebody, or a message to somebody, or a text to somebody, or you, you could do, what is it, a, a video chat, you know, with somebody, and, and, and glorify God in that way. We're just so spoiled in this country, in our day, with all the resources that we've got that we could use for God's glory. Uh, and yeah, the place that you live in, we live in a country where, you know, you could can walk down the street with your Bible under your arm and no one's going to, well probably not assault you or arrest you or say, well, what's that, where do you think you're going? Uh, you know, we have liberty, don't we, to exercise, you know, what we believe and to gather together like we are this morning, what freedom to do that. Not everybody's got that freedom in the world, you know. So these are all our talents. These are all gifts. Some are, are peculiar to just each individual. Some are things that we share. Uh, but there are also spiritual gifts as well. Uh, for the Christian, uh, discernment, wisdom, teaching. The, these come from the Holy Spirit. So whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, God has, in His grace, given you these talents. He's given you things that can be used for the glory of God. It's important to see that it's God who's given them. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, What hast thou... That thou didst not receive. So, so anything that's good, anything of value that you have, you receive from where? From God, right? You, you didn't deserve it, but God gave it to you. Again, uh, James chapter 1, verse 17, the Apostle James says, Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. In other words, it comes from God. All these things that we have, all these these blessings, what does the old hymn say? Uh, count your blessings, name them one by one, and you will be surprised 
what the Lord has done. I mean, a great thing to do, particularly if you're going through a hard time. Think about all of those little blessings, everything that God did for you. All that God has given you, your talents, your, your resources. So that's the first thing to notice is, when we talk about talents, really we're talking about, I'm going to use the word resources. You know, your talents, your resources, just to get us away from thinking of the idea of you know, being in a talent contest. Uh, no, it's, it's all the opportunities, the time, the, what God has given me, my intellect, my ability to empathize with others, and so on. You know, and we all have varying gifts, aren't we? Some are very good at those things. Some have lots of time, some have hardly any time at all. Some have lots of money, some have hardly any money. But we can still use them for the glory of God. We have resources that God has given us, just like the Lord in the parable gave those talents to his servants. And the servants were encouraged to, to trade them, weren't they? To take those talents, to take what you have, and trade it, or to make, if you like, uh, an investment. Yeah, you've got resources, now the Lord is saying, right, I want you to invest that, I want you to trade it. And, uh, and, and if you do that, uh, there's, a, there's, there's something else coming, and that is rewards. Did Jesus say, you know, I'll make you, you've been faithful in little, I'll make you rulers over much. And whatever that means, I don't know what that means, rulers of what exactly, and, and whether that's spiritual or physical, but it, it shows that there is a reward that's coming, isn't there? That your faithfulness in using those resources, using those talents for the glory of God, that, that He expects you to invest them, to use them for Him, and that if you do, there'll be some rewards that's coming your way. Well, if you don't want a reward. Some people think like that, you know, well, well, I don't really want a reward. Does that mean that I don't have to invest what I have in God? No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Uh, because, you see, uh, particularly as believers, we have uh, privileges. No? Yeah? We have privileges of being a child of God. And with that privilege uh, comes power. Or, if you like, free will. So, so now I've got all these privileges, I've got all these resources, I've got the privilege of being a Christian uh, and, and knowing the Word of God and, and knowing the Gospel and, and knowing all about Jesus. So I've not only got my resources, right, I've not only got my, um, my talents, but I've also got this knowledge now of the Scriptures, of the Gospel. I've got something to offer other people and it comes down now to my free will. Will I do that? Will I take my talents, meager though they might be, you know, you might be uh, uh, someone who, who struggles, who, who is not, uh, uh, you know, the greatest uh, communicator, but I've got these things. Am I going to use them uh, for, for God's glory? We have privilege, we have power, is the, what we call the power of free will, and that, and that leads us to consider something else. We've got a responsibility. Yeah? As, as sons of the king, we have a responsibility to use these for his, his glory. And that has always been what God has wanted from mankind. Just turn to Romans chapter 1. We have a Bible with you. This is the accusation that God, the Spirit of God, through really the Apostle Paul, brings to humanity. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they knew God. Now they didn't know Him intimately, like a Christian would. This is the, even the pagan nations. They knew there was a God. Right? They knew that there was the one God. And it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So, God gave them these resources. He gave them their intellect, uh, their tenacity, their, their communication skills, their time, their opportunity, but they did not use that time or that opportunity for the glory of God. They used it for themselves. And that's the accusation against them. You didn't glorify uh, God. In the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, it 
asks the question, what is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. I think that's quite a good way of putting it, isn't it? You know, that, that's, yeah, that's your purpose, that's your chief end of, of men and women, is that we glorify God and we enjoy him forever. And that's what we're called to do. So let's think about that for a moment, just think about um, what you have. And you can say, well, I, I haven't got very much. You know, uh, uh, what can I do? What can I do for God? He's, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a one-talent person rather than a five-talent person. But you know, that's what Moses thought, wasn't it? Remember God said to him, right, you're going to go and you're going to lead the people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And he said, well, I, I, can't, I can't speak. And I can't, you know, what, well, what if they don't listen to me? And God said, well, what's that in your hand? It's like a staff. God said, throw it on the floor. He threw it on the ground, didn't it? And it became a snake or a serpent. And what's that show you? It's like whatever resource you, you know, Moses' resource was a staff. <laughs> I've got a bit of wood in my hand, what use is that? Well, whatever you've got, God can use for his glory. It's are you willing to lay it down? Will you, as it were, throw it down on the ground and say, here you are, Lord, use this. Use this for your glory. And we've got to think like that. We've got to stop thinking about what we don't have. You know, I don't have this, I don't have that, and if only I had this. You know, you've got what you've got. And God has given you what you've got. Therefore, improve it. Use it for His glory. Now, how would this work out practically? Let me give you a little illustration. Let's say, for example, Every week, uh, you meet up with a friend. We'll call her Janet. Okay. So every week you meet up with Janet, um, and and you go for a coffee with her, and you spend the afternoon having a chat together. Um, and you think, yeah, well, what, what, what can I do with that? But straight away, I can see that you've got some talents there. You've got time. Not everybody's got time to take a whole afternoon out of their week every week and spend it with another human being. Well, you've got that. That's one of the talents that God's given you. You've got time. Presumably, you've got money. Unless Janet's footing the bill. You've got money. You can buy coffee. You can buy cake. So you can use those things. Presumably, you're a good communicator. Because you tend to not want to spend a lot of time with somebody who isn't. So maybe, maybe if you've got empathy, maybe you can empathize with Janet. So you can see there's the makings there. If that's your talents, I mean, I mean, it could be like, yeah, but I'm busy all the rest of the time. That's the only time I've got, you know, or, you know, I haven't got much money. That's, I can just about afford a coffee and a piece of cake. Right, okay. Well, let's, again, stop looking about what you've not got. What have you got? You know, how can you use that for God's kingdom? So let's, let's assume that Janet's a Christian. So when you get together with her, you spend that afternoon together once a week. Do you talk about the Lord? Are you talking, are you encouraging her on her <laughs> spiritual journey? Are you, are you, you know, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. That when a Christian is with another Christian, something spiritual happens. You, know, you encourage one another. You ever had that? You've got a really, particularly if you've got a close Christian friend and you're talking about the Lord, and talking about the Word of God, and, and, and maybe even confessing your faults one to another, like James says. And you come away from that meeting feeling elated, feeling like God has done something. Say, oh, I just have time. You know, with a friend, you should feel so much more positive about the Lord. And, and, and that's that's how you should use that time. That's how you should use that money uh, and, and those skills, those talents you've got for the glory of God. But let's assume for a moment that maybe Janet isn't a Christian, that she's just a friend that you've had for years. And you get together with her once a week uh, and you talk to her. So, so my question to you would be something like, so have you shared the gospel with her? And I've had questions like this with people over the years, you know, as fast as you do, talk about these things. And, and the sort of, sometimes the response is something like this. Well, I wouldn't 
wouldn't share the gospel with her because I know she has her own opinions about that. Uh, and, 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 and I don't want to make her, you know, cross. I don't want to make her angry. So no, I've not shared the gospel with her. Okay, so what about, what about if, you, if you're not actually going to say to look, need, Janet, you need to repent, you need to get right with God, you need to believe on Jesus. What about if you just shared your testimony about how you became a Christian and how important it is to you? Oh no, I couldn't do that because she, again, she's got her own opinions about that, she's, you know, she would get really cross if I did that. And we're trying to avoid the subject because it spoils our friendship. You heard people say that? She's trying to avoid God. Because I know it would spoil the friendship. So what about just offer, you know, saying, would you like to come down to church? You know, an invite to church. No, I don't think I could really do that. So then you're kind of left thinking, so hang on, you've got this time, which is a talent of God. You've got time, you've got money, you've got resources, which the Lord says you must invest for Him. <coughs> and and you're not doing that. So my question would be. So why are you taking a whole afternoon out every single week to spend time with this individual? And do you know what the kind of answer you usually get is? It's an indignant answer. Well, because I'm the only Christian friend she has. Well, fat lot of use that. It's some friend you are. If you have, huh? I'm alright. Some friend you are, if you want me to tell her that she's on her way to hell. Some friend you are, if you won't actually share the gospel with her, but you're just using her so you can have a nice cup of tea and a coffee. But it's worse than that. It's more serious than that. In the scriptures, you know, um, Ezekiel 3 verse 18, and repeats it again in chapter 33. This is what God says. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, that is, he will die in his sins. But his blood will I require at thine hand. So it's saying, he will die, or she will die for their sins, but I will hold you responsible. Why? Because you did not tell them the truth. You did not tell them that they were dying in their iniquity. You didn't confront them with the truth about where they were at. So they'll die and they'll pay their price for that. But I'll hold you responsible. Wow, that's, you know, that's a really heavy thing, isn't it? It's like, so I'm responsible? the people that I know who are unsaved and if I don't share with them the gospel, if I don't tell them that they're in danger, then God's going to require that from my hand. And whatever you think that means, it doesn't sound good, does it? But there's a mentality, you know, uh, in the churches where people say, well, uh, I haven't done that, but I've lived a good life. All the things that God has given me, my life, my time, my money, I've not squandered them. You know, I've not, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, gone on a, a three-day bender or something. You know, I, I, I've kept my time for the Lord. You know, I, I've always been at church, always been at all the meetings. I, I've not, I've not squandered my money. You know, I've, I never, I, I, I've never drank, I've never smoked. Uh, you know, I, I've not put, you know, a week's wages on lucky boy at the... I don't know, 3.30 at Doncaster. You know, I, I kept it, I kept my life pure and clean and good. Does that remind you of anything? That reminds you of the last servant. Look, Lord, here, here's what you gave me. I buried it, I hid it, I kept it safe. I didn't squander it, I didn't misuse it. Well, what was his reaction? A wicked, slothful servant. That's not what is required because you see, we are servants. That means we do service for our king. Would you do service for Jesus your king? We sing. Yeah. Would you do service? Are you serving him? Do you have acts of service that you do? 
for God. And, and you know, the, the defense that the last servant gives is, well, uh, I knew thee, so says to his Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. Is that Jesus? Is he a hard man? That, uh, you know, that he, he reaps where he hasn't sown? Is that true? Does, does, does Jesus ask for something back that you can't give him? Or that he didn't give you in the first place? But Jesus calls his bluff in this case. And he says, okay, put it in my own terms, you know, if, if, if you thought that I was this hard man, that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not strawed, then wouldn't that, that have driven you to, to go and invest what I've given you? If you thought I was that kind of man, or I was that harsh and that, and that but, uh, unreasonable, wouldn't you have been the first one? Thank you, Lord, and, and run in and go and invest in it as quick as you can out of fear, if nothing else. So what we find out here is that this is actually, um, actually an excuse. And we have another, another of these parables, very, very similar in Luke 19. Let's have a, just turn there with me. There are some details that are different, um, but in essence it's the same kind of parable. And I think this sheds a little bit of light on the, the motive behind the servant and why they did what they did. Uh, so, So in verse 12 it says, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And, and he, he called his servants and delivered them ten pounds. So you see it's like a similar thing. It's, it's money. You know, I'm, just, I'm going away now. I'm going to return. But in verse 14 it says this. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. We will not have this man to reign over us. So they send like a deputation of people. Send him a message. Tell him we're not going to have him ruling over us. And that I think is at the heart of this. Is you've got all these things that God has given you. Your intellect, your time, your communication skills, your money. Uh, whatever it is that you have that you could use for the kingdom of God, but instead you say, no, we hate, we hate being told what to do. We don't want to, we want to do what we want to do with our talent. We don't want to use it uh, for his glory. We will not have this man to reign over us. And there are some Christians today who are saying, we will not have this Jesus to reign over me. They don't say it out loud. But, you know, if you've got all this stuff, if you've got this time, this money, uh, this this intellect, this this technology at your fingertips, uh, a, a knowledge of the scriptures, all the things that we have that God has blessed us with, and you won't use them to glorify God. Aren't you saying, I'll not have him rule over me? Aren't you denying the Lordship of Christ? Saying, I reject that. The, yes, I'll have salvation. Thank you, God. But I reject the Lordship of Christ. I'm not going to have him rule over me or tell me what to do. I might, I might fake it up. I might pretend that I do. That, that he is my Lord and that, that I do do his will. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating, isn't it? You know, we'll show you an example of that then. When do you do that? When do you use the resources that God has given you? To serve Him. When do you do uh, those works of service? You see, Christ uh, keeps no servants to be idle. He employs servants to do a job, isn't it? He doesn't keep idle people. Here it is. I kept it for you. And what does He say? Cast ye that unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like hell, doesn't it? 
That's the only place I can think of that's like out of darkness where there's weeping and gnashing your teeth. I mean, I'm just here, I'm just, just delivering a message to you. You know, I'm just telling you what it, it seems to me to be compatible with that doctrine in the Bible. So this is a really serious thing. That God has given us things and if we're not using them for His glory, that He's going to come back and we're going to say, well, here you are, uh, here you are, Jesus, here's my life. Look, I kept it, I didn't squander my money, uh, I, I, I didn't abuse my time. Uh, look, here's your, here's your talent you gave me. And he's going to say, he's not going to say, thank you. But he's going to say, thou wicked and slothful servant. Wicked and lazy servant. We might say, well, doesn't, doesn't the Bible teach that we're saved by grace through faith? That it's not about works? let not say that, you know, just by believing on Jesus. That's... That's it. Faith alone. That, that's the phrase. We did a whole series on it, didn't we? Sola fide. So the gratia, so the fide, so the tristus. Oh, I forget what, but, but, but yeah, so the fide is, is faith alone. And that's a Christian, uh, Christian doctrine. Does, does the book of Romans teach us that? Epistle to the Romans teach us that we're saved by faith alone? Yes. But also, James teaches that faith without works is dead, doesn't it? So does that sound like a contradiction? If, if Paul is teaching that you know, it's faith alone, that that's all that's necessary, and James is teaching uh, it, it's that, that faith without works is dead, is that a contradiction? No. Because the Bible produces this wonderful, I'm going to call it a bridge, wonderful bridge between the, the, the epistle to the Romans that Paul delivers and uh, the, uh, James's epistle and this is the bridge Galatians 5 verse 6 faith which worketh by love so this is a faith which works it produces works and it does them through love through love to God and love to Humanity, love to our neighbour. It says that um, a circumcision availeth nothing, uh, or, or uncircumcision. But it's this faith which worketh by love. So it's not about you know uh, going through some outward ritual or uh, outward requirement. It's a matter of the heart. It's like has God changed your heart? Do you have that kind of faith uh, that loves God? And that loves your neighbour as yourself. Uh, you know, this is this is the kind of faith we're talking about. Um, Martin Luther uh, once said, and you probably heard this quote. He said, "We are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone." That's a good quote. You know, so in other words, we're saved by faith, faith in Jesus Christ. We're not saved by works, but once you have that genuine faith. It will produce something in your life. It will produce not just an attitude, uh, not just a change of values, uh, you know, uh, a hungering, a thirsting after righteousness, but your whole life will change. You, the, the, the time that you used to spend just on yourself, uh, the money that you used to spend just on yourself, all the things that your flesh wanted, other people whom you used to be but just talk about, you know, trivial things. Now that changes because you've got a new heart. You've received a new heart from the Lord. The scripture says that God will take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, a soft heart, yeah, a heart that loves other people. And the evidence of that will be that your talents the things that you have will now be employed in the kingdom of God. They will now be put to work in the kingdom of God. And, and, and that's, that's what we've got to look at when we analyse our lives, when we look at our lives before the Lord. Am I using what God has given me <coughs> for His glory? When He returns, will He be saying to me, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not... Did you keep what I gave you? And did you keep it safe and clean? And he's, he wants, he's like, oh, where's my interest? What did you invest, what I gave you? What did you invest that in? 
How did you invest it? Well, I only had one towel. I only had a little bit. That, that's not the question. Some people are five tapping. Some people are just like, whoa, they're so talented. They're so clever. You know, they're so, uh, uh, they're so brave. You know, you look at the lives of like the, the Christian martyrs and people like that. You're like, how do they do that? How, well, maybe they're a five talent person and you're a one talent person. You know, God gives his gifts as he chooses them. You know, he, he gives them to who he wants to. It's up to God. But they use them for his glory. So even if you only have a little bit, think of the woman uh, with the, the widow's mind, yeah? And she puts her money into the offering. It's not very much. That's hardly anything. What does Jesus say? That's all she's got. That changes everything. It wasn't the amount she put in. You know, you could, you, she could have given a much larger amount if she had lots and lots of money and it, and it would have been nothing. But when you put in all you have, that's what God's looking at. She put in all she had. And that's what God expects from us. Not just not just financially, in terms of money, but in terms of everything we have, our intellect, you know, our skills, um, uh, the opportunities that are before us, put in everything you have. That hymn that we listened to, it's, it talked about uh, to spend and to be spent for those who have not their saviour known. Know, that, that's the idea, that's, that's the Christian doctrine here is what have I got? What has God given me that I could use for his glory? You know, just, just the, the sort of, in fact I was reminded actually of Pat, uh, being very much on the thoughts at the moment, how she used to come and take a handful of leaflets, and then she'd get on her mobility scooter, and she'd be off out the door and post them through people's doors. This is a woman in, in her 80s, yeah, in her 80s, you know, She's got, she's got, she's got a scooter. She's got mobility. She's got a hand. We've provided the leaflets. Yeah. What are your resources? What have you got? Can you do more than that? Can you glorify God? And it's not about glorifying the church here, by the way, or me. It's about your relationship with God. Because God will come one day. You stand before God. And he'll say, so what, what have you got for me? What did you do? How did you invest what I gave you? All those opportunities, all that time, all that money, all those, those skills of empathy and communication and your ability to use language to present something to somebody and your knowledge of the Bible and all the good teaching you've got and, and your, your determination and maybe even your determination that serves you well in other areas of your life, yeah? Maybe you, you, you've got a kind of career where you know, you, you, you're going up the corporate ladder because you've, you've got that tenacity. You've got that, you know, I won't let go until I, I succeed here. You've got that staying power. And, it, and it's serving you in one area of your life, in your career, but is it serving you as a Christian? Is it serving you? you know, your, your, your willingness to work hard until you get results. Do you take that with you into your Christian life to, to glorify God? Are you, are you kind of right? Yeah. I'm going to work hard at this gospel. I'm going to work hard till I understand how to present the gospel to somebody. I'm going to, I'm going to work hard. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to go through the center stop. I'm going to find every homeless person. And I'll talk to them and see what they need. You know, do you need a coffee? Do you need something to eat? Well, you know, I'm going to do good with my life. And that's really what I want to talk to you about is, this morning is, Nobody is saved by good works. Understand that? I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. You'll never find salvation by doing good works. It will never be enough to wash away your sins. But we are saved to do good works that God has prepared for us in advance, the scripture says. Like God's got all this stuff, all these, these, these little things for you to, for me to do. He's prepared them in advance. Just like a Lord has got, you know, he's got his house and uh, uh, the duties of his servants. And he's got in mind what he wants his servants to do for him. And, and, you know, you've got that privilege. And I've got that privilege of being Christ's servant. We've 
we've also got responsibility to now do it. We've got the power to do it because we've got free will. You can either choose to do it or not do it. But think about the rewards. Think about the consequences here of not doing it. You know, these are, these are serious, uh, solid, solid consequences. Saved by faith alone. Saved in faith is never alone. Let's glorify God in our lives. Let's use what we've got, however small, to glorify God. And, and then, you know, that day when we stand before Him, we'll be excited, we'll be waiting to hear those wonderful words. Well done. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. This parable that's uh, difficult in some ways to think about and apply to our own lives. Lord, I pray that we would embrace uh, what you're teaching here, Lord, that we would embrace the fact that we have opportunity, that we have liberty, Lord, that we have ability to glorify you, and Lord, that we would use it to the fullest of our uh, capabilities, Lord. In Jesus' name.